Hi, my name is Jamie Jolly, and this is an introduction to Farsight, our new casual war game, if you can call war casual. It's a um, battle in a box for two to four players, plays in about an hour to an hour and a half. It's a kind of war game you can take to a board gaming night and actually finish in a single sitting. Um, the game works on many different levels. The first level is the battle map. The battle map is a place where you can use, bring about your grand strategies, your flank charges, your vanguards and rear guards, and be able to move your units tactically around the map. There are terrain bonuses and objectives to take and all kinds of different things that you can do to give you an advantage in the outcome of the war. Um, another element to this game is the is information so actually in our game, like in real warfare, information is a vital um, component to your victory. If you can gain information on the enemy whilst keeping your own things in the fog of war, you gain a big advantage. And so in this game, all stuff starts off as uh, hidden. It comes onto the board face down. And uh, using different mechanisms, you can reveal the enemy's forces and gain information about what the enemy's plan is. The second level to the game is the shadow map. So um, the shadow map is done on this board. This is a um, on the back of the player board, and this map is a facsimile of the battle map, where you can place all of your specialist units that can have a big impact on what's happening on the main board. In every war, there's these individuals who, with the right um, bullet at the right time, could end the war. And so we wanted to represent that in these games. We have assassins, we have spies and saboteurs who can help influence and heavily change what's happening on the battle map turn to turn. Above that as well, we then have the weather itself. So um, in our world, the, the world is racked with storms and it's all gone to hell in a handbasket, really. And you can um, you have these um, events that come out randomly during the game. But in the, the future that we have, there are these robots called seers and they have the ability to, um, to manipulate the weather and can actually help try and bring these events down on the enemy instead of your own troops and try and just swing things to, to, to your advantage by using the weather as a weapon. So those are the three levels the game works at. Um, stick around and we'll teach you how to play the game. When you come to a game of Farsight, you have a few decisions to make. Uh, right at the beginning, if you just play in this game for the first time, there's a couple of training missions you can do just to get yourself acquainted with the different mechanics of the game. So the first one is called First Contact, where you only play with the battlefield units and you don't play with the specialists at all. The second one um, would be when you add in the specialist units are called for, uh, espionage, and that's when you can start to become acquainted with the specialists um, and how they work. And the third one is when you add the th um, all the elements in together and you add the events in um, to be able to play and so it just lets you have a, a nice easy access into the different mechanics as you're learning the game. For this case we're going to assume that you're playing a standard game. So the next decision you have to make is what type of a battlefield do you want? Would you like to play on this standard map or would you like to flip this over, get a blank map and then create your own custom terrain so you can just lay it out exactly as you want or there are rules for random terrain generation. We'll assume in this one that you're going to play, um, to play on the standard map. The second, uh, the third thing to do is then um, work out your team. So in a, a game of Farsight, there are always two teams. Um, so if it's one player versus one player, there are two different teams. If it's three players, you'll have two players on one side and one on the other, and four, you'll have two and two. Um, this way that then the players are um, on a team together sharing their objectives and trying to win the game, um, win, win the game together. This stops people players getting picked on in a 3v3 situation where it's always best for two people to kind of just crush one guy in the middle. Um, the, the, the next element of the game is whether or not you want to play um, with pre-built armies or build your own armies. So this is how the, um, the, the system works. On these cards, you'll see that there is an insignia. This one is a gold insignia, and there's also a silver one. Um, if you want to play um, uh, on a team on your own, then we suggest you take the gold insignia cards, and all of the gold insignia cards together will make up a pre-built army that's completely balanced with you and your enemy. Um, if you're playing on a team with um, with two players, then you would take not the gold ones but the silver ones, and the silver ones will then let you be able to play um, a, a balanced game, even against a, a, a single player with the gold insignia cards. If, however, you wanted to make a custom um, battle where you were playing without the, um, the pre-built armies, you can actually use these star values. So the star values, every unit has a, a number of stars attached to it, that's its cost, and we suggest you start with a 30 to 40 point game you say okay we're gonna have a 30 star game and you add up your points for, for the specialists and the battlefield units and combined that will be your score and you'll know that you guys have both have a balanced army when you play having the same amount of stars in your army and you can decide how exactly how many stars you want because it's entirely customizable for you the first phase to the game is the events phase um, each team will roll one dice 
and on any symbol that turns up, they'll get to pick an event. So one would roll that, one would roll that. Uh, neither of those in that case would get an event, and so they wouldn't draw a card. But if they had rolled either the, the hit marker or the exclamation mark, they would be able to draw an event, and that team would draw one event card and play that card. Um, this is the phase in which the seers will start to have an effect. And so if you have deployed a seer, you'll be able to turn that seer face up and you'll be able to, instead of drawing one card, you'll draw two cards and pick which event comes to pass. You'll then be able to re-roll one dice per turn with the seer. So if that, um, that plague lands somewhere that you don't want it to land, you'll be able to re-roll that dice to see where it goes. Um, for coordinates for events, there we have these coordinate dice. So when you have an event that says it in a, lands in a random space, You'll roll the two dice together, and this would say I2. And so you'd find I and 2 on the board, and that would be the square in which that would land. And they'll tell you um, specifically any additional information you need to know. Once the events have, um, have been passed for both teams, uh, you then move on to the deployment phase. During the deployment phase, teams will alternate taking in turns to deploy battlefield units and specialist units. Generally speaking, each player will be able to deploy one battlefield and one specialist unit per turn. However, this is where the specialist supply lines come in. So if you have a supply line that you deployed previously in the game, you'll be able to use this now to place an additional one battlefield or specialist unit um, during this phase. You can have one for each supply line you have. When it comes to deploying them, you'll take um, battlefield units first, you'll have one battlefield unit and you'll place that down on the board, on the back row of the board anywhere you want. But the, when they come down, they come down face down onto the board and they cannot be placed on top of other units. Then, after all the battlefield units are placed, you'll to place the specialist units. So you'll take a specialist unit, like the supply line, and you will take your dry white pen and write, write its location down on the shadow map, hidden from the enemy, anywhere you want. Make sure you keep this information, um, information hidden. Then that card will just go down, face down, along the edge of the board, um, on your board, board edge. This will go backwards and forwards, one battlefield unit, one battlefield unit, one specialist, one specialist, until all of the um, the units have been deployed that you um, are allowed to this turn. As I said, generally one apiece. Once the deployment is done, you'll then go on to the specialist phase. The specialist phase is a chance for your specialist to try and hamper the enemy and, and hunt the enemy specialists and generally get an advantage over what's about to come in the battlefield phase. So the um, phase starts with you taking your shadow map and keeping it, making sure it's hidden from the, um, the opponents. And you'll begin with hunting with an assassin. So during this phase, all of these guys will get to have a go, apart from the supply lines and the seers. The seers trigger their events during the event phase, and the supply lines trigger theirs during the deployment phase. So you don't need to worry about activating those in this. You will be using spy saboteurs and assassins. So the assassin um, will begin this round. The first team will take an assassin, and they will try and hunt an enemy specialist on this board. Now, the way this works is with um, a bit of guesswork and a bit of triangulation. And you're trying to find those specialists where they are and when you find them they are destroyed so the way it will work is you'll begin with um, a finding a place on the map that you believe their specialist may be operating so say I'm looking for a spy and I might say I think your spy is in this square so you'll take this square and you'll look to see if you can find that square on the shadow map so as you can see the square here is directly one right from this objective all the objectives on the board are marked onto this shadow map so you can see that that objective is there and so one to the right of that is there so this square here we're looking for for a spy. Now let's assume this was the um, enemy's um, board. They're looking for a spy, and as you can see, the spy here is north of the guest spot. So what they do is they would you, the enemy will say they've missed, they haven't actually hit the thing. If they had hit it, they would be destroyed. But when they don't get the right spot, the assassin will go to that square and pick up a trail. And that is represented by the enemy team telling you just how many squares off your guess you were. So in this case, if this was the enemy's map, they may, they would go one, two, three, four, you're four away. The player can then write down that number into that square and they'll have that information that will have an information point that as they then hunt again and again and again, they'll track down closer and closer and closer to being able to surround and kill this enemy. So um, that's how they'll be with triangulation. They'll be able to work out just where on the board that particular specialist is operating. So um, just so you um, um, ha have a, an easy way of being able to know if the number is correct that you're um, working on, let's assume that instead of the spy, they've gone for a saboteur over here. Um, so you start from this square here and you just use the rule, go diagonal and then straight. So you'd go diagonally until you're in a straight line with the saboteur and then straight. One, two, three, four, 
five. And that will give you the right answer every time that you, um, you try to go for a hunt. So that would be five away for the saboteur. Once all of the assassins have had an attempt at hunting a specialist and any of the specialists they hit have been wiped off of the board and also been removed from the table edge, you can then move on to the spies. Now the spies will be able to have a, an attempt at turning over enemy units that are flat face down, revealing them, giving you a big advantage. It slows them down and makes them much less combat effective. The spies have a two square operational range, so uh, including diagonals it will make a big square box in which the spies can operate where if an enemy unit is within that box you can once per turn be able to flip a unit over and reveal it replacing it with either the model if you have the models or just to flipping it over so that it's on the face up side so this would happen that if this um, spy was in this square and you had it, uh, the enemy had a unit there it's two away you could flip it over and then it would come onto the board being replaced by your model and a token to show that it's your um, that it's your model once all the spies have had a chance to reveal information about the enemy, you then move on to the saboteurs. For each saboteur a team has, they'll get one of these sabotage tokens. And just like the spies, they have a two um, square operational range. So including diagonals, it'll make a big box that they can operate within. And they can sabotage any one unit within that, um, within that area. So you take the token, starting with the first team first and going alternate turns like everything in the game, um, you'll be able to place the sabotage token down on one of those units. This unit is now crippled. This has big effects on the, the unit. The unit for this turn cannot move and it also has um, quite reduced combat abilities. So once you've done all of your assassins, your saboteurs and your spies, it's then time to move on to the battlefield phase proper. The battlefield phase is subdivided into several smaller sections. First we start with artillery, then go to movement, and finally combat. Just like in real life, shells move faster than people, and so you start off with this big ordnance barrage that comes down on the enemy positions, then you move in your um, infantry and mechs to finish the job. Artillery in this game is represented by these hit dice. Now everything in the game has a very simple um, health system. You start with an uninjured unit, and these units represent, say, this may be um, several squads of mechs and maybe a, a battalion of infantry. This is um, this square represents kilometres of space, and so it's a very high view of warfare. This um, this particular battalion has um, starts off uninjured, but once it gains a hit by someone rolling that marker, um, that mark will represent them taking casualties. So they gain a casualty marker, and then if someone rolls one again, they'll get heavy casualties, and finally they will die. And so it's very simple in the game to work out whether, what sort of state somebody's in. Now in our, um, warfare. For real, when you're firing artillery into a position, the more tightly packed the enemy is, the more damage they will take. So what we do is we take the amount of health states there are left on the target and work that out. So an, un an uninjured unit will always have three dice to start with as it has three damage states left. Then we'll apply any modifiers that there are. So there are two main modifiers to remember when it comes to artillery. The first is if they are on an objective, you'll take a dice away because they're defended. And if they are an armoured unit, there's um, two heavily armoured units in the game. One is the armour and the second is the prototype. And you'll be able to see that by looking on their card and seeing this shield icon. If they have heavy armour, they're less likely to take casualties and so you'll take a dice away. And so an armoured unit on an objective, you take two away. For this situation, this artillery here is firing on this armoured battalion, and so you'll take three dice, take one away, and then you'll roll those two remaining. Now, this um, uh, ex exclamation mark symbol doesn't mean anything outside of the event, so you don't need to worry about that during the battlefield phase, but this one definitely does. So this is the one that will do casualties, and so you'll take your casualty marker, stick it on the unit, and they have suffered um, casualties effectively one third of the way to dead. Like all the phases in the game, artillery is um, alternate activations, and so the first team will go first, then one artillery, then the other team will fire, and backwards and forwards until all the artillery has had uh, their opportunity to lay waste to the enemy. After that, we then go to the movement phase, where the first team will be able to move one of their units. Now, movement in this game, again, is very simple, so you can start to see what the enemy can potentially do with their units in the game. Every unit that is revealed will be able to move two squares orthogonally. So, for instance, this armoured unit could go one, two, or one, two during their movement phase. They can't move diagonally, and they cannot move across lakes during the game. The um, 
face down units in the game, they have the ability to move three no matter what. So they're 50% faster than revealed units. And so this one will be able to go one, two, three into this unit or one, two, three over here. The important thing is to remember they can't move diagonally. Uh, moving across terrain doesn't affect you apart from the lakes which are impassable. Now, when it comes to um, being able to engage something in combat, as I said, because these squares are um, very large, they're kilometers of space, each one really represents its own battlefield. And so to be able to engage a unit, apart from the artillery, no other um, battalion will be able to um, attack at range effectively. They'll be moving into the battlefield to actually start a combat. And so if we wanted to attack this infantry unit here, this armoured unit would have to go one and two into the, the, the enemy square. And so what you can see here is that this, um, this unit is uh, contesting this square. For, um, for other units that may want to come in and flank this armoured unit or attack them, they will need to be able to reach this square, not the one they're contesting. Currently, the contested square is owned by the infantry, and the combat will decide who gets to keep that square. But the armoured unit is in this square, trying to get into this square, and that's represented by him crossing the, uh, the, the little line there between the two of them. In this game, um, flank charging is an important part of the game. And so if we had a situation where the infantry was up here, um, it's possible for a unit to be attacked from multiple sides by multiple units. So the, the armoured unit might move into here, and then the uh, other unit, the hidden one, may come into the side like so, creating a multiple combat in that square. The final rule in the movement phase is um, the fast units. So most units have said they will be able to move two and then three when hidden. These units, the assault unit and the prototype, are also fast units, as you can see depicted on their card here by this lightning symbol. That will let them move three at any time, whether or not they're revealed or hidden. Once all the artillery has had an opportunity to fire and all of the units on both sides have had the opportunity to move, then you're going to be able to do the combats. Now, combats aren't triggered immediately um, as soon as you move into a square, but they happen at the end of the movement phase when everybody's had a chance to move. This represents the simultaneous movement of all of these battle lines coming together in a big grinding crush of metal. Combats are worked out from left to right from the first player's perspective. You'll pick a combat where multiple units are involved and you're going to be able to resolve those by looking at the amount of dice and then rolling them. So the first um, numbers that we need to know about are the native attacks and defences of the unit. So a unit um, like the infantry starts uh, to roll three dice, no matter what, it, whether it's attacking or defending, it rolls three. Now um, this unit here is the defender and so it will roll three dice. The um, second unit in the fight so far is the armour. The armour has um, an attack of three and a defence of five. So because he's attacking, he's moving and contesting someone else's square, he will roll three dice for this. And then we'll reveal this unit. This unit here is also an infantry unit, and we'll reveal it, replace it with the model, and we'll see what it does. So it's going to get three dice as well. So these are the starting pools of the um, each of the units. But then we go to the modifiers, the second important section, which is depending on the um, situation by which they came to the combat, their dice are going to be heavily affected. You can see on the player board all of the modifiers are here in this little list, um, all plus ones and plus twos and minus ones and minus twos that will affect the amount of dice you're going to roll, increasing or decreasing your, your power in that, um, in that combat. So in this case we'll, we'll, we'll run through what's happening here specifically. The first thing that we need to know is that there, this is a very heavily armoured unit. Armoured units have a shield on the card, you can see it here. And that shield means that no matter who, whether or not they're attacking or defending, or however many people are attacking them, every unit that's involved that's trying to hurt this unit will lose two dice. So this infantry unit will lose two dice. The second thing that's happening we need to consider is the um, situation in terms of flanking. So this assault unit is not flanking this unit. They're just head to head. There's no negatives or benefits for that. But this unit is. This infantry unit came from the fog of war in an ambush and went into the enemy's flank. So what will happen here is, is that this unit will lose a dice and this unit will gain a dice. That means, as you can see, there's, this unit is already heavily penalised by the situation that it's come to this fight from. But there is always the rule that there's a, a lucky shot. And so once we've worked out all of these things, if, if one unit has no dice at all, it'll always get one dice um, just in case. Now, this unit here was, um, was um, hidden. It was um, face down at the beginning of this fight. And so because it was face down, it ambushed the enemy and gained an additional two dice here. 
And I believe that's all that we have in terms of combat modifiers for this situation. Other modifiers that you need to know about um, simply are um, defending. If you're on top of an objective or in a forest, you will, um, the enemies will lose a dice each for trying to attack you there. And if you're on a hill, um, then you'll gain a dice from either defending or attacking from a hill. So you gain one there and, and the enemy will lose one for the objective in the forest. Then from the flanking point of view, um, you, can, you can be flanked twice on any unit and, and also you can be rear charged. Rear charging is the worst situation you get in and you will lose two dice, the enemy will gain two dice. Those are all the combat negatives um, you need to remember to be able to do it. And as I say, they're on the object, they're on the player board so that you um, can work it out each time. Then we just roll the dice off. So because these two units are attacking the same unit, you can actually pull those dice together and roll them as a big hand. Um, this, this guy's only attacking the armor at the front, and so he'll only get that one dice. The target priority is that you will always attack the thing in front of you. If there's nothing in front of you, you will attack something on your sides. You get to choose either left or right, throwing all of your dice against that, that, that um, battalion. And then finally the rear. So we'll roll these dice and see what happens. So this, and it will roll a lot of damage. And the infantry, trying to stand its ground, will do a single hit back. So we take these dice and we roll, add them together. So there are five damage points here. And as we said previously, the, um, each um, unit only has three health states. So it'll go from light, heavy, and will actually die in the process of, of trying to defend this square. However, one brave last stander will um, basically put a bullet through the visor of one of these um, mechs and cause it to take heavy casualties um, from the as a result. Then once the um, combat is resolved, we'll be able to move the, um, the units and they'll be able to advance and retreat. So this unit having been destroyed won't do either of those things, it will just be removed. And then the owning player will get to choose which of these units will advance into this square. So in this case, they'll decide that the armor is gonna go back to where it came from. All the units will go back to where they came from if they don't advance. And then um, this infantry unit will advance and they will be able to get a free facing. All units that survive a combat will be able to free face at the end of the combat, this unit being um, removed as, um, as a casualty of war. Obviously, the infantry unit in our combat was destroyed, but if um, it wasn't destroyed and it just say, sustained heavy casualties like this, it would then be made to retreat from its square. The reason it would have to retreat is because it lost the battle. Now, um, the way you can tell if someone loses the battle is basically on the damage that was dealt. This side managed to do five damage in total in the battle, and this one only did one. And so these guys won. Um, just so you know, if there's ever a, a draw between them, defenders will always win on a, on a draw, on a tie. But in this case, he lost, and so he would be forced to retreat, and so they will move one square back towards their board edge if possible. Um, if it's not possible for them to retreat, say so there's another unit in the way, they will retreat sideways. If it's not possible to retreat sideways because there's another unit in the way, they will just die and be removed from the board. But in this case, we'll say they can retreat forward, and then the other unit would come in, and both the units would be able to get a facing in this case. In Farsight, you can get some really big, meaty battles going on where lots of units are involved in a single combat. And just show you how you can resolve these simply without too much complication, we have an example here. So in this situation, the infantry has been attacked by a prototype, and then a lot of stuff is just piled in behind um, trying to defend that infantry unit. So in this case, what will happen is you start at ground zero, which is the infantry. They're the only ones defending. And both of these two units will roll their dice off against each other, with the prototype having to remember that it will receive a negative for being flank charged by this one. They'll roll their dice, and then you'll be able to resolve the next person in the chain, who's this one. This one will flip over and do its damage back. Now, every unit will only ever roll once its damage. So the prototype will throw all of its damage against this unit. Um, if this unit dies and there's a damage, left over the remaining damage will pass on to that unit uh, in this case that unit is an armor now if it is armored like an armor or prototype you'll lose one of the damage states that passes over to represent the armor that's um, involved there as i said though it, this prototype will only roll once so during it will roll against this unit and then when this um, gets to attack in a minute it won't roll a second time and do damage again so just this one will roll its damage and then after that this one will roll its damage now of course this armor has to remember it's being um, rear charged by by this one and so you'll just roll one unit at a time as you go down the chain if a unit is destroyed somewhere down the chain and hasn't yet attacked yet, it still gets to roll all of its dice because all of this is represented to happen simultaneously. And once all of these are finished, so say this um, unit dies and this unit dies, 
what will then happen is that you'll roll all, we will count up all of the uh, damage that is done between these units, um, and then who, whichever side has done the most damage will win, and all of its units will retreat, uh, will, will advance, and all of the enemies will retreat. And so this would go in here, and this one would go in here, and this would retreat back to where it was. The object of a standard game is to try and take these objectives and hold them until you have eight objectives. Now these can be eight objectives anywhere on the board, or if you can control three of the enemies back four, you'll also win the game. You have to hold those objectives for one whole turn, so you start a turn with eight and you end a turn with eight. However, they don't need to be the same objectives. Now to take an objective, you take a unit during the movement phase and you can move on to an objective. Once, if you hold that at the end of a turn, you'll be able to flip that to your side and it becomes your objective. So you will hold that objective whether or not you have a unit on it. So if at a later time the unit moves off, the objective will remain yours. So that's a brief introduction to the rules. I hope it helps you get a grasp of the game. Just so you know, on top of the normal game, there's actually a way of playing the game completely dicelessly. So if you want a, a strategic game where there is no randomness, there's no weather, there's no... Um, random bullets flying through the visors of prototypes at 400 yards and taking out your most valuable units by pure luck or accident um, you don't have to um, you don't have to have those and so you can play it where you get rid of the dice and instead you have a combat strength system and so you take the amount of dice you would roll say seven and you would turn that into a strength and then for every three points of strength you have you do a casualty to the enemy so if you have seven it'd be three and six and the last point would be discarded because it has to be whole sets of three and so those three and six will become two casualties you do on the enemy. And that way you can, can quickly turn this into just a completely high strategy um, game. But of course, if you like the theme, if you like having fistfuls of dice to throw and that feeling of the randomness that real warfare would have, where the old saying goes that, you know, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy, then you can have that as well. But I, um, I hope you enjoyed that. And let me be the first to say welcome to the war.